there couldn't be a better time for Bitcoin right now. And I feel a little bit like we're in position. It's ours to lose. This should go well. The price should be higher. And I just want to do everything, you know, in our power to help support that happen. Hello there from Bedford. How are you all? How are you all coping with this lockdown? Now I'm conscious that some of you may be facing some difficulty with work or just with the challenges of being stuck at home. So I've received quite a few emails over this last couple of weeks, which is great. I love receiving emails, whether it's good feedback, bad feedback, or even just discussing show ideas. I really do appreciate all of it. So if you are a little bored, if you do want to reach out to me, feel free to do it. I do reply to everyone. Anyway, welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by Kraken, the best place to buy, sell and trade Bitcoin. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and today I've got an interview with my sponsors, BlockFi. I've got Zach Prince and Flory Marquez, the co-founders on the show, to talk about how they handled the recent market volatility. But before that, I do have a message from all my other show sponsors. So first up, we're going to talk today about Cointracker now. They've been sponsoring the show for a couple of months. It ends at the end of this month, so I do want to give them a final boost. So listen, if you are thinking about how to calculate your tax and you want to use a service that takes away all the complexity and does all the work for you, then I couldn't recommend more highly Cointracker. Now, during this sponsorship, I've talked about the feedback. I've talked about people saying, listen, why are you supporting a tax company? This is not Bitcoin. But listen, I know There are some tough decisions here. And if you don't want to pay your tax, that is totally cool. I do pay my tax. I don't fucking want to, but I pay it because I don't want to go to jail. And I use Cointracker. And look, it was so easy. All you do is add in your wallets and your exchanges, and they calculate it within a couple of minutes. Filings work for the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. And if you've got less than 200 transactions, then it is free to use. But if you're one of those crazy traders, if you've got thousands and thousands of transactions and you're thinking, how the hell do I deal with this? Well, you can get a 10% discount by using the URL cointracker.io forward slash A forward slash WBD and Cointracker is C-O-I-N-T-R-A-C-K-E-R. Also, let's talk about my new super amazing sponsor. Love these. Love sportsbet.io. We just had the premier What Bitcoin Did poker tournament. We had 503 people registered. Some guy took me out. I was holding Ace King and he took me out with an A2. He hit runner, runner, 2-2. Two, two. Yeah, I wasn't happy about that. But fair play to him. It was a great tournament. We're going to have another one coming up soon. Can't wait to get that organized. Now listen, if you are wondering who Sportsbet.io are, then you will have definitely heard of them. They are the company that put a Bitcoin logo on a Premier League football shirt. Yes, they put it on Watford's shirt, and they invited me to go and see Liverpool's only defeat of the season, which was bullshit. That really annoyed me. But thank you so much for the team. I actually went to a couple of games, and they asked to sponsor the show, and even with all this coronavirus lockdown, even with sports not on in a number of countries at the moment, they are like, Peter, we want to support the show. So I've registered, I've used it. Now, they've got they've got some sports up there. They've got Russian ping pong, which is active right now. They've also got markets for esports, including eFIFA. They've got their Bitcoin casino and my fave, the poker rooms. If you want to check out Sportsbet, head over to sportsbet.io, which is S P O R T S B E T dot I O. Okay, so on to the show today and have my sponsors, but also my good friends Zach and Flory from BlockFi. They've been sponsoring the show for nearly two years. I've got to know them really well. Spent a bunch of time with them. Now listen, whilst they've been hugely supportive of the podcast, I know there are people out there that are critical of BlockFi and have questioned whether a Bitcoin financial services company could manage a black swan event, what would happen in a time of high volatility, what would happen to loans, what would happen to the Bitcoin that they're loaning out to other companies, what would happen if they default, all important questions. Zach and Flory have always reassured me that they have robust risk management systems in place. And this is it. The coronavirus pandemic has triggered a market crash across the board. This was the test that was waiting for. This was the situation people were worried about. So I had a chat with Zach, had a chat with Flory, and I said, look, come on the show. Talk about what happened. There were rumors online that BlockFi suffered during it, which was bullshit, by the way. But there were these rumors. 
perhaps by people who just wanted it to happen. But I got them on the show. I was like, come on, let's talk about this. Tell us what happened. But I also got them on to ask about other things. People have questioned using them for custody because to use part of the service, you do have to custody it. They've also asked about their rejections of coin join transactions. Again, I put this all to them. Now, listen, I am a customer. I have been using their interest accounts now for, for a number of months. I've got skin in the game with this company. If there are risks, I also want to know about it. So listen, they covered everything. We covered everything. I put every question to them. So hopefully this will answer some of the questions for you. All right. So before I head out, I just want to say I love you all. Thank you so much for every email I've received. So many in the last couple of weeks. Perhaps some of you are bored. If you want to reach out to me about anything, please do. I do respond to anyone who sends me anything, as long as it's not some weird nonsense. And also, listen, if you want something else to check out, please do go and check out my other show, Defiance. That's available at defiance.news. You can also check out my films, which are there, and I have a new film coming out next week, which I can't wait to get out. All right, take care. If you want to reach out to me, it's hello at whatbitcoindid.com, and have a great weekend. Hi, Flory. Hi, Zach. How are you both? Doing hey, well. Just uh, feels a little bit like Groundhog Day every day, but other than that, can't complain. We're smack dab in the middle of uh, our, what are we now, fourth week of quarantine. Yeah, I've actually got some questions for you about that as well. Um, but first, we need to introduce Flory to everyone because she's not been on the podcast before. And she is the secret source behind BlockFi. Keeps the wheels, keeps the wheels turning <laughs> while Zach's out there making business. Say hello, Flory. Introduce yourself. I do like to stay behind the scenes. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I know we've known each other for a while and excited to finally be on the show. For those of you who don't know me, I am the other half of the founding team of BlockFi. And I run everything from operations to sales, marketing, basically whatever we need to build. That's true. Yeah, we've hung out in Uruguay, New York, and where was that event we were at in the U.S. last year? Uh, <laughs> which one? Uh, probably at uh, Consensus at no, some point. Crypto Springs. Um, oh, Crypto Springs. Yes, that was, I think, my favorite event that I've been to in the States. But I do keep thinking about that stake we had in Uruguay and wishing yeah. I was there right now. Well, events are dead right now. So it's all online. So anyway, look, I've got a question for you. Quite an interesting one, actually, before we even get into any Bitcoin stuff. Is, is your office completely closed down is everyone working from home right now yeah we've been closed down since the beginning of march we actually did it uh the week before new york put in place the stay at home order and the nice thing about blockfi is that we all work on our laptops anyway so it was pretty seamless to just move everyone to work from home we made sure everyone got a second screen or whatever they needed to make themselves as comfortable as possible um and it's been as seamless as it could be so the question I really have for you, because I think it's quite an interesting thing right now, is that how have people responded? Are they liking the fact they get to work from home? I mean, I know myself, I like a bit of both, right? But do you think this is actually going to ch change your business in a post-coronavirus world? Do you, do you see you changing your structure at all in that allowing people to work from home more? Is that something you're even thinking about? Because I think it's an interesting question for right now. Yeah, I mean... It is a really interesting question. We're lucky that 50% of, because we have offices in Poland and Argentina, 50% of our workforce was already remote. So we already have a lot of people on the team that knew how to work remote and they're kind of teaching us how to do it now. In terms of the people out of the New York office, I know that we, we work really closely together and we really like working with each other. So I know a lot of people miss the camaraderie and the energy of the office. I definitely miss walking in and just high-fiving people, which we can no longer do uh, <laughs> for many reasons. But we have, you know, moved over to doing a lot of things like daily stand-ups, which is something the engineering typically does over video conference. So we, we do that for the business side now. We're trying to do fun things to keep ourselves close together. We did a trivia night. I know our uh, director of people ops did like a Pilates class today for people that wanted to join. Um, so we're getting really creative with how we can try to stay connected. And I do think that when this is all over, um, my guess is people will be sprinting back to the office just to be able to hang out with each other again. Yeah, because you miss that social aspect. But there are all these kind of other side benefits. We haven't eaten takeout in three weeks and we would have usually at least one night possibly two a week. We're cooking fresh food every day. 
we're spending more time together, we're exercising, we're hanging out. There are all these side benefits that have been forced back upon us. And I'm just in that kind of place now. I'm wondering, I wonder if we keep any of this in a post-coronavirus world. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely been cooking way more. And I've actually spoken to a lot of friends that I haven't talked to for a long time. I think, you know, everyone's making more of an effort to stay in touch, to kind of fill our days. And I do love that I'm saving an hour and a half of my life every day without commuting. So it is nice to know that we have this option if we want it when things get back to to normal. Well, I don't know if there is a back to normal. It might be... There might yeah. be a new normal. All right. Well, listen, look, it's good to talk to you both. Uh, it's been a while since Zach's been on. So there's a few things to talk about. Zach, you were on before because I took some criticism for having you as a sponsor because there are people out there who are small. I say a small group, but question Blockfire as a business. And we've you've been on before and you've openly talked about it. And there was a specific tweet thread at one point from a guy called Alpha Zeta who questioned the business and question what would happen in a kind of serious market collapse, black swan type event. I think we've had it now, right? That You couldn't have had a, a more, a, a, a bigger market crash. This is unprecedented. As I understand it, the crash was bigger than during 1929, the Great Depression, although somebody might tell me it's different. But this was this was the time to really test the fragility of BlockFi as a business. And you've come through it. So do you want to talk about... And it depends, it might be a question actually for you, Flory, but do you guys want to talk about what happened, how you're aware of what's happening, what the impact on the business has been, how you dealt with it all, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, sure. So maybe maybe I'll start. And um, I think Flory can you know, uh, fill in some details. There were some pretty phenomenal stats in terms of uh, increases in volume on our, on our client service team and, and stuff like that, but j- just at a high level. So you know, we made our first loan in January of 2018. We uh, now have three products in market and the company uh, has been very fortunate to, uh, you know, grow ever since we launched our, our first product. So we're at larger scale than we've ever been before and we have more clients than we've ever had before. So that was kind of the backdrop going into this market event. We have prior to this managed through three periods of, you know, what prior to this event was the extreme end of Bitcoin downside volatility, which was generally like 30, 35% in a single 24 hour period. Uh, This was 50% down in a single 24 hour period. I think it's important to note that uh, we've also managed extreme volatility to the upside. So there was a 40% up day in uh, Q4 of last year. So we don't look at this event in a silo in terms of our risk modeling. At the highest level, we you know, very successfully navigated the volatility. BlockFi did not sustain any lending losses whatsoever. Uh, so our track record of performance in terms of uh, you know, never losing any capital from the lending risk that uh, we're taking is intact. And additionally, pretty quickly after that day, we were back in market lending and uh, other folks who are participants in the institutional crypto lending market didn't recover to that kind of like solid footing as quickly as we did. And the net effect of that for us was that the uh, supply in the market got constrained. Uh, We were one of the few folks standing still lending both cryptocurrency and dollars. We were able to charge higher rates. So this volatility happened in March. Immediately starting in April, you know, we update our interest rates once a month. Immediately starting in April, uh, we raised our interest rates for uh, both Bitcoin uh, and Ether, uh, which was great. And the KPIs that, you know, we track from a you know, company perspective are primarily uh, revenue, funded accounts, and balances. Uh, you know, balances of Bitcoin, balances of Ether, balances of dollars. Um, all of those things were, were all up month over month. We had a weird week where uh, some of those metrics looked a little bit different and broke with the trend of kind of, you know, rapid sustained growth that we've seen. Uh, But month over month, they were all up. So, you know, we're, we're in a great spot. We're more bullish on crypto than we ever have been. (laughs) I mean, 
could there be a better kind of macroeconomic backdrop for Bitcoin right now? I, I don't think so. And then to touch on some of the specifics. So anytime that uh, the Bitcoin price goes up or down, especially dramatically, our risk management system is taking automated actions. And those automated actions could range from uh, adjusting someone's dashboard that they look at to monitor their loan and you know, flashing kind of like yellow warning signs. It could be that we're issuing someone an official margin call, either a, a retail client or an institutional client. And it goes all the way through to us uh, liquidating collateral that a uh, borrower posted for a loan if they don't respond to the margin call or if the price just moves so uh, severely against them that uh, we're left with no other choice. Taking those actions is not something that we that we you know take lightly at all. It's not a good, especially on the downside, it's not a good client experience. Nobody wants to get a margin call. We don't want the price of Bitcoin to uh, to go down. So there's been you know, a lot of kind of care and thought put into how that system is designed and uh, the way that we manage in those scenarios. We're now on the third version of our risk management system. Um, and to put it very simply, in version one, you know, a certain LTV trigger might have been hit and we just instantly sell some collateral. In version three, that still happens some of the time, but we also gave ourselves the option to hedge in certain scenarios. So one of the things that we did on Thursday, towards the end of the day, was some of the things that we monitor were kind of flashing warning signals, specifically the health of liquidity available in the spot market was flashing warning signals. So we hedged a little bit prior to Thursday evening. This is all on March 12th, which was the 50% down day. And that enabled us to not need to sell client Bitcoin during the period of time where the prices reached their lowest point, which was around 3,700, 3,750 uh, that evening, the lowest price that we that any of our clients' Bitcoin was sold uh, was around 4,700, 4,650 maybe. And we sold less of our clients' collateral, we believe, uh, than any other lending platform on a percentage basis because of the sophistication of our risk management system and because of the way uh, that we managed throughout that period. So yeah, you know, the, I mean, th those are some of the, those are some of the main points at a high level. I'm happy to go deeper into any of those, or, or maybe, you know, if you want, Flory could touch on some of what we saw in terms of like metrics, which were incredibly different uh, for a few days than, than they are on kind of like our steady state operations. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely got more questions, but Flory, is there anything you want to add in there? Yeah, I would say that, you know, there are two parts of the client experience that are really important in downward volatility. The first is how are we going to manage your crypto when prices move down? And Zach just recapped, which is basically, we're going to sell as little as we can at the best price possible. And we believe that we have a better risk management system than anyone else to be able to allow us to do that. And the second part is client service. So when things like this happen, it, it's scary. It, I think it's difficult for a lot of clients to know what's going on and understand what's going on in each company. And um, Zach keeps mentioning metrics. Basically, that week, we had three times like a 300% increase in calls and emails. And throughout that week, we were able to continue to pick up the phone every single hour of the day. We answered every single email that came in within our average of around five to seven hours. And I think our clients really appreciated the fact that we're transparent, that you can pick up the phone and ask us, hey, how's your business doing? And even in the craziness of this market, we're going to do everything that we have to do to make sure that you can have that conversation with someone at BlockFi. And something that made me both extremely surprised and happy was the fact that coming out of this, we saw really positive client testimonials kind of appreciating the fact that we were able to do that. Um, it went so far as some guy on Reddit posted an entire thread about how even though his loan did get liquidated, he appreciated the fact that we did everything in our power to not liquidate them and that he was just happy to be a part of our community and be able to pick up the phone, get transparency over what's going on. And this is completely just unprompted positive feedback in what we consider to be one of the worst client experiences that can happen on our platform. Okay, so that's cool. But there must have been some people who are pissed off. 
Yeah. I mean, some people are, you, you don't want your crypto sold, right? And that's the unfortunate downside of a lending product backed by crypto. Um, to Zach's point, we, we give people as much time as possible to try to get them to send us additional collateral or send us wires to make payments. Something that really frustrates people is just how slow the banking sector moves. So there's this concept of making a payment through ACH, and that takes three to five business days to get to us. And that's so frustrating for people when you have crypto market moving down 30%, right? The fact that they can't just get us cash as quickly as the crypto price is moving. I guess that's a good argument for be holding digital dollars now. And you've yes. obviously added support for those. And I was having a conversation with somebody about this recently because – you know, while I I'm you know mainly Bitcoin and focus entirely on Bitcoin, I've always felt like there is a solid argument for digital dollars as long as the platform or the blockchain they're on is stable. Uh, but somebody said to me recently, I can't remember who it was. It might have been Rao Powell in a recent interview, maybe on somebody else. But they said there's actually a solid argument for holding digital dollars now because it saves having to keep it in a bank. It's 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 quicker to move it around. You don't have a, as high a risk of it being seized. So it makes sense to be holding part of your dollar savings in digital these days. So I guess if people started doing that, that, that would be quicker for them than having to wait for a bank transfer. Yeah, I think the clients that had the best experience were those that were depositing with us because, you know, there's two upsides. One, anyone who has a savings account in the US right now. I'm not sure about interest rates overseas, but right now, you know, Ally used to give me 2% a year and now it's down to 1.5. So at BlockFi clients, like we maintained our interest rate of 8%, which is nuts compared to what you can get in the banking sector. And then the clients that did have stablecoin on our platform could meet the margin calls faster, right? Because you can just sweep it from your interest account into the loan. Okay. I've got some specific questions about the accounts but i mean you've been sponsoring the show it's nearly two years now i know that's mad it's uh, i think it's august 2018 you started so we're uh by the time we come out of lockdown it will, it will have been a couple of years and i've obviously promoted you guys consistently i'm obviously your best uh, uh lead generation to no, i'm really kidding <laughs> uh, but no so i've always done it and I, I and i've always got a lot of people sliding to my dms and they're like oh i'm thinking of signing up with blockfi i'm a little bit nervous you know what do you think and i always have to say look i can't give you advice and the same with the ad i'm always like do your own research i can't tell them what to do and i consistently do that but one of the things is that i think there are many casual crypto holders who look at something like blockfi and they think okay i can get some interest I'm here. I'm interested. But then they'll see something like a thread on Twitter and they'll be nervous. Yet I think some of the people are probably like me. They don't really understand a lot of the things that have been talked about, about these market collapses. So one of the things that came up is the talk of a gap risk. Now, I kind of understand what a gap risk is, but I don't really. Can you explain what a gap risk is and where and how relevant that is to what you're doing? Sure. So um, gap risk, uh, you can think of it as kind of like a uh, cousin or a sibling of like a flash crash. So, uh, you know, the market moves significantly uh, in a direction without a lot of liquidity in between. So Bitcoin goes from trading at, uh, you know, 7,200 to 10,000 or 7,200 to, you know, 6,000 and no trades happen in between. It just gaps up or down. And, you know, we, we have a gap risk with our lending positions. And uh, it's something that, you know, like the other liquidity and volatility uh, metrics that we're constantly monitoring that we model to. Uh, we think it's, you know, exceedingly unlikely that there would be a gap in uh, Bitcoin price movement of a magnitude that would cause our positions to be underwater. Um, but we also have a plan for what we would do if, if that did happen. So I don't know if that fully answers the question, but gap risk is just, you know, a big move in one direction without liquidity in between. And uh, when Zach says that we model the risk, what that means is on a daily basis, we're looking at what if the market did this right now? would we have the ability to still 
make sure that we process all the withdrawals for the day? Would our lending portfolio still be healthy, both on the institutional and the retail side? So we're looking at that on a daily basis. And that's why on the risk management side, when the volatility happened in the middle of March, the best people have asked me, like, what was it like? And the answer is it was just like another day for a crypto lender. Right. Okay. So what are the different challenges that you face with borrowing and lending with crypto that is different from traditional currency markets um well from uh you know from traditional currency markets not much they're actually they're actually quite analogous to traditional currency markets they're a bit different from traditional equity markets in that uh the market operates 24 7 and relative to both currency and equity markets the liquidity uh is more fragmented in terms of uh, the different venues where it exists and I would say, you know, overall, there are uh, more market participants that are like newer kind of startup be just given how nascent the crypto market is. Um, you know, in the FX market, you're, you're probably primarily dealing with folks who have been participating in the FX market for 10 plus years. And, you know, nobody's been in the crypto market for 10 plus years because it hasn't existed that long. So you have to be a lot more diligent about, you know, who you're working with and, and selecting the platforms and, and institutions that uh, you want to face in, in terms of uh, your counterparties relative to traditional markets where there are certain platforms and counterparties where there's, uh, you know, just based on their brand name, there can be an assumption that, you know, they're very, very legitimate and well-established, et cetera. And I guess the, the risks here are different between the loans market and the interest account. So on the loans market, the risk is that someone does get liquidated. And it sounds like you try and give a bit of flexibility to people. You're trying to, you, you don't want them to get liquidated. And I guess there are just certain scenarios that you can't do anything about that, like you touched on earlier. Yeah, in general, the way that it works is people start receiving emails that their loan is close to being liquidated earlier in the week. And in general, by the time that someone has been liquidated, so if that's the 80% LTV ratio, which can happen at any point in time, those clients have received at least three days worth of emails letting them know. Right. Okay. With the interest accounts, one of the things that also came up is that people are fearful of the people you're lending to in a massive market crash. If a number of the people you're lending to couldn't pay back their loans, then that would put your business at risk and therefore their funds at risk. Can you talk about that side of things? Yeah, sure. So the risk there is actually in the opposite direction. So when we're lending Bitcoin to someone in a Bitcoin denominated transaction, uh, if the price of Bitcoin goes down, they actually low, owe us you know, less on a dollar denominated basis. So uh, the risk is more to uh, the upside. So like when there's a 40% single day up Bitcoin move or you know, just sustained price rallies for cryptocurrency is when we would see the same risk from that type of lending that we see from the USD uh, lending when the prices moved down. So who are we lending to and uh, what are they doing with the cryptocurrency? Um, the vast majority uh, of our institutional cryptocurrency lending business is done to market makers and proprietary trading firms. The profile of these firms is that they typically look like a Susquehanna. Uh, who's also an equity investor in BlockFi. And I'm not saying that they're a client specifically, but that's like the profile. So what are some of the important things about that profile? They've got over $100 million in equity uh, in their business. Less than 5% of their business uh, is in the crypto markets. And they have a uh, track record as a regulated US domiciled uh, financial services company that's uh, you know been profitable for a long time. 80 to 90% of the lending, depending uh, on the day uh, that we do on the institutional side, is two counterparties that fit that kind of profile. Um, so what are they doing with it? We, we give Susquehanna Bitcoin. They give us collateral. You know, what, what are they doing with the Bitcoin? I mentioned earlier that one of the differences in this market versus FX is uh, the fragmentation of liquidity. So if you're a market maker... Uh, you fundamentally get paid, you know, the, to use the simplest example, you buy something for 99 cents on one exchange uh, and you sell it for a dollar on another. Uh, and to do that in crypto, 
you need to trade in a lot of different venues. Um, you've got futures on the CME, you've got spot on, you know, Coinbase and Binance and Kraken and Gemini. Uh, you've got options on Darabit and then you've got derivatives platforms uh, like uh, BitMEX and FTX uh, and OKX, all that, you know, do substantial volumes and there's opportunities to make markets uh, across uh, those different channels. So the implications of that are two things. One, it's not particularly capital efficient to trade the crypto market because one, liquidity is so fragmented and you have to go pre-fund your accounts at all these different venues. But two, in the same way that a bank won't give us a loan secured by our Bitcoin, the prime brokers that Susquehanna and others work with for their traditional businesses and their financing needs won't give them financing for the cryptocurrency trading that they're doing. So, uh, and then, and then lastly, some of these venues are Bitcoin in and out only. You can't, you know, you can't go trade on BitMEX with any currency other than Bitcoin. Um, so they need uh, inventory in the underlying asset that they're making a market in. Um, so those are the reasons that they're borrowing from us. We're helping make them more capital efficient. We're giving them inventory, which they're willing to pay for in terms of the you know, interest rate that we charge them to borrow cryptocurrency. And their risk profile is very low. These are well-capitalized, uh, established uh, businesses that have been around and made a lot of money for a long time. Um, what are they not doing? What they're not doing is borrowing Bitcoin from us and you know, selling it into the spot market so that they can have a short position. They're doing stuff that's way more sophisticated than that. Uh, and, and actually also way less risky than that. That that would be too risky of a bet for them to make because they don't make directional bets on which way the market's going to move. They just want to buy something for 99 cents and sell for a dollar. Um, and then, uh, you know, we also do a, a little bit of lending to uh, other types of cryptocurrency specific counterparties, exchanges, miners, uh, and we haven't touched ATMs, uh, ATM businesses yet, but uh, we might uh, in the future. But that's small, you know, relative to the overall size of our activities. Right, okay. But okay. yeah, going to the original question, which is for our listeners that are out there thinking, you know, what is the risk on the interest account, and how should I think about this? Um, I would think about it the same way that you manage an entire portfolio, which is look at the BlockFi interest account, look at what the interest rate is, understand what we're doing to generate that yield, and then figure out for you as an individual, what percentage of your assets do you think are worth earning 6% on an annual basis? And that could be 5% of your portfolio. It could be 50% of your portfolio. Everyone is different. That There are risks associated with it, and that's basically what the interest rate is worth. Next up, I talked to Zach and Flory more about Bitcoin volatility and how BlockFi handled that. But before that, I do have a message from my amazing sponsors, including BlockFi, which is strange enough. All right. So first up, let's talk about Kraken, the best place to buy and sell Bitcoin, the only place I use for buying and selling Bitcoin now. And have you checked out their beautiful mobile first app? They launched it last year. It really is a very easy way to trade Bitcoin when you're on the go. Now, when the market opens up. Perhaps you'll be on a train, you'll be on a plane, you'll be at Starbucks waiting to get yourself a caramel frappuccino. Listen, wherever you are, if you want to trade Bitcoin, you can do it on the go with Kraken's amazing mobile app. Also, despite all this price volatility, the crisis has seen a huge surge in interest in Bitcoin and Kraken are hiring. They're hiring through this. They are looking to increase their workforce by 10%. Now, if you do want to trade with Kraken, they have such a broad suite of tools. Everything from the mobile app, which I mentioned, to Kraken.com, to the Kraken OTC desk. They've got all your bases covered, and they are the most secure crypto exchange, and they do have the best customer support out there. There is no better place to trade Bitcoin. If you want to find out more, head over to Kraken.com or download the app. It's available for the iPhone and Android. Just search for Kraken Pro, which is K-R-A-K-E-N-P-R-O. Also, we have BlockFi, the guests of the show. Yes, BlockFi, the future of Bitcoin and financial services. They have been crushing it for the last two years. They've just raised another $30 million to keep growing the business. So what do you get with BlockFi? Well, firstly, you have the interest accounts. 
which I am a customer of that allows you to put your crypto to work and earn monthly interest payments on your Bitcoin. They also have their crypto back loans, which allows you to access liquidity without selling. By using your crypto as collateral, you can unlock up to 50% of the value of your assets in USD. They've got their mobile app coming and they've got their Bitcoin rewards credit card. It's going to be another massive year for the company. If you're interested in checking it out, I do recommend you do your own research and then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. And, and, and I would say the other key criticism that comes out, which is, you know, in some ways I would say is fair, even though you're my sponsor, I will say is fair, is not an actual direct criticism of your business, but it's the asking somebody else to custody your Bitcoin, right? There is a risk there. There is a risk that we've had in the industry ever since the Mt. Gox, where people have always been worried about something happening. And look, if, if something ever did happen to block fire, people would be like, I fucking told you so. But that is something that people highlight as, as a risk. Now, uh, the the payoff is worth it for me. I've got skin in the game. I'm a customer. I threw some Bitcoin in with you and I've left them there and I'm, I'm happy with the risk. But other people point to that. You can't get away from the fact that people have that opinion. But what have you done in terms of how it's custodied? Is it insured, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. So our primary custodian is Gemini. We think that they are one of the safest, most regulated custodians in the space. We have a very close relationship with them. Um, the Winklevoss, who started Gemini, also are investors in BlockFi. Um, and so we basically think we have, we work with best in class partners. Um, but kind of going back to the point I just made, we don't want all of your crypto, right? We don't want you to give us 100% of everything that you own. What I want clients to do is to think about, you know, is it worth having everything that you earn? The everything that you own earning zero, or is it worth having a small percentage of your assets growing over time? And is that opportunity cost worth it to you? And it's definitely a personal choice. I mean, I understand people who don't want to do it. It's up to them. And I think there are a lot of people who will stand by that. I, I, like I said, I've got skin in the game with you guys. And I don't have any, you can confirm, I, do I have any preferential treatment? No, uh, zero preferential treatment. Zero preferential treatment. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing that I like to remind people of, and this is with cash and with Bitcoin and with everything, which is every single day that you're not earning money, you're technically losing money because other people are earning money. Well, the, the other question I'd put to you is actually, if you weren't providing this liquidity to the market makers, what would they be doing instead? I guess what I'm getting at is a company like BlockFi and the other lenders in the market are actually important for for the exchanges, right? It's for, it's for liquidity, right? So um, the uh, you know ability to uh, borrow assets, the ability to finance activities where you're participating in a in a marketplace is kind of you know critical to the healthy functioning of a capital market. And without that function, uh, you would expect that the uh, market size would be capped at you know a lower size than if the market did have that function. So you know we're not we're not the only ones doing this, right? Uh, so like if, if BlockFi went away, what would actually happen is that someone else would you know, fill, fill our spot and, and provide the need uh, that the market has. But yeah, it, it's, uh, it, help, it helps grow the market overall, it helps create more liquidity uh, for, for the space. And one thing to keep in mind is the fact that the value of an asset or technology goes up as its utility goes up. So what we're doing is allowing people to do more things with Bitcoin and more things with Ethereum. And what that means is that over time, it'll drive the value of those underlying assets. Yeah. And just to, just to add to Flory's point, I, uh, I self custody. there's all different types of people. And I like had a, a treasure for a while and I kept it at home and I told my sister, my like secret, uh, you know, recovery phrase, and the whole thing made me very uncomfortable. I'm like, I'm like the type of person that you know loses my apartment keys twice a year. I, I don't want the responsibility, and I don't know if there's more people like me or more people who want to, you know, uh, self custody. But it's definitely the reality that there are multiple types of people uh, in terms of wanting that responsibility or not wanting it. And, and one thing that I've advocated for 
you know, for folks in the Bitcoin space who believe in self custody is just keep keep in mind that uh, it doesn't have to be a one size fits all solution. Uh, other people have have different preferences, and it's actually quite jarring for someone who comes from the you know traditional investing the traditional investing world where you don't custody anything to start researching Bitcoin and then hear that you know you're a total moron if you don't self custody. It's like well. That's a pretty extreme view, and you might scare somebody who has no idea what that means. So, you know, tr try and educate folks, uh, and, and we certainly uh, try to do that at BlockFi, and are, are big supporters of um, self custody, and we think it's one of the fantastic qualities that that Bitcoin has. That's very unique. Uh, it's just not necessarily for everyone. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be for my dad. My dad, I don't know if you saw my tweet the other day. My dad, um, I had to teach him copy and paste. He didn't know what copy and paste was. <laughs> and then today he phoned me up and I had to, he didn't know how to print from his computer. Bear in mind, this guy was an aircraft engineer for 30 years. He kept planes in the skies. And he did, today the, the, I had to show him how to print, but he didn't know the difference between printing an email and printing or whether it was an attachment or a PDF. And, uh, yeah, trying to explain it all to him. If he wanted Bitcoin, there is zero chance he could custody himself. But, I mean, I would still recommend most people, they've got to find out about custody and they, they should look into it. And also look at things like CASA as well. And I, I agree with you, sir. So I think it's imp I think it's important that people will find out how to custody as well. All right, so that's cool. Well, listen, look, you guys, big big couple of years, another massive year. You've just raised a shitload more money. Was it, was it like 30 million you've announced? You've announced that, right? 30 million? Yeah, 30 million. We, we announced it. Yeah, you did. Um, can you tell me like any of the numbers behind the business? Any patterns you're seeing? Is do a dollar market becoming more important for you? Can you tell me any of the stuff going on there? Uh, sure. So, um, you know, we're fortunate to be, uh, you know, relative to other high growth venture backed companies um, in kind of the upper echelon in terms of our metrics right now indexed against other companies. So what does that mean? Um, our key KPIs of revenue and funded accounts that I touched on earlier are growing at month over month rates of uh, 25 to 40%. The business is generating uh, you know, millions of dollars per month uh, in revenue now profitably as of Q1 this year. And it, it kind of you know shows no signs of no no signs of of slowing down. We're growing the team to support uh, the growth of the platform. We've got uh, over a hundred people working full time at BlockFi now. Uh, over a hundred thousand accounts uh, on the platform. Nice and clients from over a hundred countries. Wow! I, I don't know. Lori might have the exact number. It, it might be like a hundred and twenty. Uh, I'm not sure, but um, clients from over 100 countries. You know, so the breakdown of our of our business, like by asset, um, Bitcoin is roughly 60% today. Dollars is 30, and then uh, Ether and Litecoin, you know, together make up about about 10%. So you know, Bitcoin's still uh, the biggest part of our our business. We we hold some Bitcoin on our balance sheet because <laughs> uh, we we think um, we think it's a good thing to hold. And well, that's an interesting point. Do you want to talk yeah. about that? Because I do the same, even for my little podcast. Uh, if I have to bill, I reckon about 30% of my invoices are in Bitcoin, and I keep 25% of that actually on the balance sheet. Yeah, well, um, partially we do it for uh, for risk management uh, purposes, but we also partially do it because we you know, believe it's a, a smart <laughs> position to, to have, and we believe uh, it aligns with you know, the ethos of, of doing what we're doing in this market. So the risk management part of it is that, uh, you know, people hold Bitcoin with BlockFi. Uh, we have a liability to those people to pay them an interest rate in Bitcoin. Um, it's possible that, you know, one day some of our institutional Bitcoin borrowing clients might all pay us back early. And in, you know, one month we might not generate enough Bitcoin from interest that we charge those folks to make the payments to our clients, we would still make the payments. Um, our margin would just be, you know, negative for a certain period of time. Uh, but we'd rather have Bitcoin just, you know, available to to do that. So that's the risk management side of it. Is any part and, of it do you do because, like, part of it I do because I think it's smart, but part of it I do it because I feel like it helps contribute towards it. It's showing faith in the industry I'm part of. 
Exactly. That's the ethos part, right? Yeah. I mean, look, at the end of the day, the, the single best thing in my mind that could happen for the cryptocurrency industry is for the Bitcoin price to go up and for the market cap of Bitcoin to get larger. And so, you know, if us having a, uh, you know, low seven figure Bitcoin position at all times helps that a little bit, then like, you know, we're, that's just one, uh, one other way that we're, you know, helping uh, contribute to the, to the cause that we're all, you know, ultimately contributing to. Did you say you're in, how many countries are you in? Over 120. I think it's close to 126 right now. I've got listeners in 180. Oh, nice. <laughs> So maybe maybe we can move that number up after this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got one guy in Iraq. Wow, <laughs> one guy in Iraq. All right. So another thing I need to ask you about because I got a couple of DMs recently from people who said their deposits were rejected because they were coin joined coins, and uh, yeah, they're a bit pissed off about that. What, what's going on there? Yeah. So we are, you know, we're we're a heavily regulated business at BlockFi at the federal and state level in the U.S. Um, and increasingly uh, in countries outside the U.S. as well. So as part of those regulations, we're MSB at the federal level and we have money transmission and, and lending licenses at the state level in the U.S. As part of those uh, you know, regulatory requirements, we have to do things like know our customer. We have to monitor for uh, money laundering and uh, you know, fighting, not financing terrorism uh, and a whole bunch of stuff. We have a compliance team of almost 10 people uh, full-time now. We have to respond to requests from the government. We have to constantly update our policies and procedures. Um, and we have to work with, uh, you know, we have to work with third parties like Chainalysis and others who provide tools to uh, regulated financial companies operating in crypto markets to help flag, you know, certain blockchain-based screens on coins. One of the things that um, you know was developed into these policies is that we do not accept coins from uh, mixing services, and that's basically the policy that that comes up when we send a note to someone saying, "Hey, you know, we saw that your funds came from CoinJoin, and we have a policy of not being able to accept those." We don't like the policy. I actually, you know, fundamentally. That's good. I'm uh, glad but, you said that because I was about to go, fucking hell, Zach, that's bullshit. <laughs> I, I don't like it and, and we don't like it. And I actually fundamentally believe that it's not rational and it's unfair to hold Bitcoin to a different standard than we hold cash. And the concept that you know any Bitcoin could be like a dirty or tainted Bitcoin, I think is uh, complete bullshit. And yeah, I, I, I just... I don't like it at all. And we've, we've, we've gone round and round on it internally. And the reality is that for a company like us who is releasing innovative products, we're always having to explain these to the regulators. We're you know, constantly making efforts to get new approvals and licenses. And then we're constantly responding to probably way more inquiries than a traditional you know, vanilla financial services company has to respond to, which puts a big burden on us in terms of time and resources. It's just not a battle that we're in a position to fight. And it's not something that we're in a position to go against the grain on in terms of what has become from anyone that we ask, whether it's a regulator or a compliance advisor or uh, our board who, you know, we ultimately have to make smart decisions and, uh, you know, explain why we made certain decisions it's just not a fight that that we're in a position to fight in terms of saying we don't think that governments should shine a better light on companies who are using blockchain monitoring services and having policies like the one we have. I wish it weren't that way, uh, but but that's where we've landed on it so far. And it's going to take regulators a little bit of time to catch up to being able to understand that there are fundamental differences between Bitcoin and cash, right? So there's two steps to how we fix this. The first is what we're doing now, which is uh, be a best in class operator within the space, work with regulators to get licenses and slowly get them to understand how Bitcoin and other assets work. And then once they can get over that hump, phase two is then 
trying to explain to them, okay, well, there are key differences between how you think about these assets, and this is really how they should be regulated. Wow. So 10% of your team is compliance. You said 10 people, you've got a team 100, 10% is compliance. Yeah. Um, it, and that's one of the reasons why we've been able to grow, right? So the institutions that pay us interest, which is then what we pay the retail depositors, would never trade with us if we didn't have such a high standard of compliance and if we weren't able to guarantee that the crypto that they were borrowing was clean. Damn. All right, Flory, you've like answered all those things, all these tough questions about concerns people have, but what are the things that keep you up at night? What are the things you worry about? And you as well, Zach, but what are the things that you two kind of worry about? Huh. I, I think I think now is a time for, um, you know, outside of Block 5, people, people are just worried in general. And I think one of the things that I'm really focused on now is, you know, you asked a while back or in the beginning of the podcast, um, you know, what are the differences between working from home? And one thing that's been really worrying me about our team is I've seen people actually do a bad job of s- stopping work. Right. And so I think it's because there's no commute home and people are bored. You know, it's Saturday. Maybe you got through your Netflix show and they're like, all right, well, maybe I'll just answer all these emails when, you know, it's the weekend. You don't need to answer those emails right then and there. So I'm worried about burnout. I'm worried about people, you know, not adjusting to this new normal well. Um, And one thing that I'm really focused on is making sure that our company, you know, people are still taking vacations. Like you still need a vacation from work even though it's just a boring vacation in your own apartment. Who is that um, guy in the US, the famous guy who wrote the book, who runs the energy company? I, oh, I've got the book in the house here somewhere. Really famous guy in the US. I can't remember what it was. I'm sure it's him. Like, you couldn't get your bonus if you didn't take all your holiday. He had, like, radical policies like that. I, I, we're, we do that. So we track how many vacation days people have taken, and we will force people to go on vacation. <laughs> like I will get on a video chat with someone and say, hey, this Friday, you're off or you need to take a week off um, because people need it. It's the only way to you know, stay fresh and sane. What about you, Zach? What keeps you up at night? Um, you know, we're, we're, in a, we're in a really good spot. So over the last two and a half years that um, BlockFi has been, been going, I think I've increasingly uh, slept better and better at night, if we want to use that analogy. But I think Flory's point is a good one, right? You always have to strike this balance. There's uh, so much that we've accomplished, but an even bigger plate of things that we have yet to accomplish, but that we know we want to do. And so making sure we have the right people in place to you know help us do those things, making sure that those people are happy and healthy and uh, highly functioning uh, in their roles with the company, which Um, includes taking vacation (laughs) occasionally uh, is always on my mind. Are you taking your your vacation? I'm I'm off on Friday. I'm I'm not working this Friday. I was one of the people that got the call from Florida. I was supposed to be on a week-long vacation (laughs) actually starting this morning to the Caribbean for the kids' spring break. But they they now don't have spring break, and the resort we were supposed to go to is not open at all right now. Um, But – yeah. Other than that, you know, like I am, um, we're going through a transition as a company this year and we're transitioning from being a company where if you didn't already own crypto, we didn't really have a product for you. You're not going to earn interest on your crypto, or get a loan secured by your crypto if you don't already have some. Um, this year for the first time ever, we have products for people who might be onboarding into owning Bitcoin for the first time. And, you know, to kind of nailing that transition, which comes with uh, a massive ramp up in terms of our marketing efforts, a massive ramp up in terms of our communication and how it's structured and, and flipping it to being a lot more educational and a lot less just, hey, here's the value prop. You can earn interest on your Bitcoin. Isn't that great? Um, it's like we need, to, we need to even be a little bit more fundamental than that with our communication this year as we grow and onboard net new people and just explain to them why Bitcoin is something they should consider owning in the first place. And then get into how you do it and the unique things you can do with it on, on BlockFi's platform. So making sure we get that right for BlockFi, but also I hope we get that right as an industry. At, at the end of the day, as I said earlier, there couldn't be a better time for Bitcoin right now. And I feel yeah. a little bit like we're in position. It's ours to lose. <laughs> this should go well. The price should be higher. 
And I just want to do everything, you know, in our power to help support that happening. Has this whole corona situation, obviously it's devastating and terrible in many ways, but has it shifted your worldview at all? I mean, I know it has for me, and I know about the changes I want to make in my life, all the ones I have that I, I want to keep and, and and what I want from business and life, and all, all those kind of things. Has it shifted your worldview and, and even your, your kind of Bitcoin worldview? Not really. Um, I was always a bit of a... Uh, you know, maybe a contrarian in the cryptocurrency sense of things. And that I was always like, I think the first podcast I went on before you would even have me on your show, it was a much, it was a much shittier, it was a horrible podcast. Like nobody even probably listened to it. But the first one I went on, somebody was like, you know, what, what's something you believe in that other people don't? And my answer was, you know, dollars moving around on blockchain payment rails uh, is going to be a really big deal maybe bigger on a transaction or market cap basis than Bitcoin. And I think that's good for Bitcoin. So I've always had this view that like Bitcoin's not going to disrupt the dollar anytime soon. If it does get on a path to doing that at some point, it's going to be after it's knocked out currencies that are in like, you know, positions 100 to 150 on the currency market cap side of things. So I think we have a long ways uh, to go there. Um, and I'm uh, I'm somewhat liberal in terms of, my worldviews. Uh, I think that you know things like social safety nets and uh, monetary policy, uh, situationally, are uh, can be used very intelligently. And I also think those are good things for Bitcoin. I think you get caught in this kind of cycle of uh, you know crash stimulus, crash stimulus, and you're kind of walking a tightrope a little bit. But yeah, I uh, I don't think my worldview shifted. If anything, I'm like on the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm like, man. I'm learning how much I really loved my uh, fast-paced lifestyle of going into the office, commuting on the train, flying, you know, once or twice a month. And like, uh, <laughs> there's like a reason I kind of constructed that life for myself. And it's because I actually like that life. So I'm just ready to get back to normal. Oh, I agree with you on the travel. I miss the flying. I think this is the longest I've gone without a flight. God, it must be since I started this, since I started all this, because I mean, I... Yeah, I flew a lot last year and yeah, I, I agree with you on that. But there's different things for, for me. It's more the kind of content I want to create and how I want to introduce people into Bitcoin. Like I'm desperately trying to get some of my friends to think about it. And they are. And I'm, I'm opening some little cracks there and I want them to think about it more. What about you, Flora? Has your worldview been shifted at all with all of this? Yeah, I mean, I think it does put things a little bit in perspective. I'm jealous of other governments that have handled this crisis really well. So I'm, I'm jealous of South Korea. I'm jealous that I don't live in South Korea right now. And I'm also thankful that uh, I live in a country with a lot of resources. So I was talking to someone on our team that works in Argentina. And Argentina took really early measures of just keeping everyone indoors really early on. Um, but it's measures that we would never take here in the US. So for example, he lives in a building. He hasn't been allowed to have any visitors for the last four weeks. You're only allowed to exit to go to the grocery store or to walk your dog. He made the joke that he was gonna put a leash on his son and <laughs> pretend that he needed to go for a walk. And But the reason that they're doing that is because they don't have the same level of ventilators that we have in the US, right? So they have uh -huh. no other option other than severely locking everyone down. Um, so, you know, I live in New York. Um, we had a floating hospital just come up to Manhattan and park here just in case we need an extra hospital. And that's a thing that many countries, most countries in the world, or even most cities in the U.S. won't have access to. Um, so on one end, I'm jealous. On the other end, I'm thankful. And in terms of Bitcoin, one thing that I would love to see throughout this is the break in correlation with equity markets. So while you did see the price of Bitcoin fall, with the equity markets. After that, it stopped uh, moving in line with equity markets, which kind of proves out its lack of correlation. And I think that that's something that makes Bitcoin really valuable. And I'll be interested to see if there are more people that are willing to move into a global asset in times where the future of each country is so uncertain. All right, cool. Well, listen, look, I always say in my ads, uh, BlockFi is, Block is the future of Bitcoin and financial services. But well, like, what's the future stuff coming? Tell me what's... I mean, look, I know you've got your sets back credit card coming. I really want one as soon as bloody possible because 
the amount I have to spend, that would be a great uh, service for me. I love stats back. So when's that coming? But also, what else is the future? What's coming in that like I'm not aware of? Uh, yeah, so we're launching our uh, our mobile app very soon in the next month or so. Uh, so we're excited to have uh, that live and in market. Um, the Sats back credit card is a is a big initiative. Um, a lot of work is going into it. It's definitely coming out. We're really excited to launch it. Everyone wants it. We, we might be coming out a couple months later than we originally hoped, just because uh, some of the partners that are involved in bringing it to market are you know uh, disrupted in terms of their business operations because of uh, the situation that we're in right now. But that's coming out, and we're really pumped about it. And we're going to be making in improvements to. Uh, the product in terms of features so we're adding security stuff more security stuff we're probably going to be adding things like uh beneficiary account like enabling people to name a beneficiary in their account potentially uh productizing offering higher interest rates for longer term commitments if folks want to see that adding more uh supported assets onto the platform like um like pax g or uh other stable coins and you know, there, there's some other stuff that we're working on too, but those are those are the big ones. Oh, ACH payments, so people can just like set up a recurring, uh, you know, recurring buy from their bank account. That'll be coming out towards the end of Q2. Um, you know, every month, if you want a dollar cost average uh, into buying more Bitcoin, you'll be able to connect your bank account and just do that seamlessly on BlockFi. Those are the big. Those are the big things. But Flory, anything I missed? Uh, redoing our entire website. <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> We're gonna have a brand new website. Yeah, soon. Well, listen, guys, it's awesome to catch up with you. You know how much I love you. Thank you for everything you've done for the last two years, supporting the show. I couldn't have done a lot of it without you. You're my first proper sponsor, and you've stuck with me. So appreciate you guys so much. Tell people how to find out more about BlockFi, how to follow you, especially you, Flory, because you have a pitiful amount of followers. Because <laughs> I'm 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 not a big social media person. Uh, I'm usually working, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm I'm founder Flory. I love a good alliteration on Twitter. Definitely love to see questions. And for people that have tough questions on Twitter, I would definitely recommend emailing them to support at BlockFi.com. Our our sales team loves a tough question, so don't don't just live on Twitter, just hit us directly with them. And you, Zach? Uh, I, I assume almost everybody has heard. I mean, our, we our website's blockfi.com. <laughs> I'm on Twitter, uh, blockfi.zach. Uh, that's Zach, Z-A-C, and, and blockfi, just like our name. So, yeah, uh, we, we love hearing from you. I think we might be the only company in crypto that also has a phone number that you can just call during uh, New York business hours and you know talk to one of the smart people on the team that Floyd was referencing. So don't be shy. All right. Wicked. Well, listen, guys, take care. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep crushing it. And uh, hopefully I'll see you soon. It's a weird one because, I mean, Flory, I've hung out with you like three times in the last year. But Zach, I've seen you like seven. I, every couple of months I would see you, right? And now we don't know when yeah. that will happen again. It's kind of weird. I don't think we've ever recorded together remotely. We haven't. They've always <laughs> been in person. Uh, always in person but we we every couple of months we'd see each other in new york or san fran or uruguay or somewhere and i honestly don't know when that will come back or how that will come back actually i mean it's one of the things on my mind is like even whether we'll be allowed yeah i mean are we gonna if, each other when we see each other again well, or is it gonna be like some weird elbow tap foot tap thing it's, it's a serious problem um you got, you got, people are actually thinking about it. i'm making a show for my other one defiance about it about social interactions in a post lockdown world, but not in like in a post lockdown pre uh, pre vaccine world, because it is a lot to think about, right? I mean, you might be able to get a flight, but do you want to get on it? But uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a somber end. Let's go back to BlockFi being badass. Anyway, listen, all the best. Hopefully, I will see you soon enough. I don't want it to be a year and a half till I get to New York because I love that city. So, all the best, guys. Take care. Love you both. Peace out. Thanks, Peter. Likewise, man. Keep up the great work. Thanks for having us on, Peter. Um, I'm glad that at least I'm getting to see your face virtually once a week. So yeah. always a pleasure. All right. So what did you think of that? Did Zach and Flory clear up a few things for you? Did they answer the questions how you wanted it? 
Does it all make sense? Now listen, I know some people will still be critical of BlockFi after this, and I get it. Some people just want pure self-custody, and you can't do that with BlockFi. If you want to use their interest accounts, you have to custody with them. Now like I said, I've got skin in the game with this company. I am a customer. I put some Bitcoin with them. I have been earning my interest, and I do know the risks, but I'm happy with those risks myself. And I was also, look, a little bit worried about these Black Swan events. People have said to me, yeah, I've read the tweet storms where people have been critical of the company. You know, I was a little bit concerned. How would they ride this out? But they did. They have these robust risk management procedures in place, and they've ridden this out. They are crushing it as a company. They are growing. And <laughs> this probably sounds like another advert. Look, it isn't. I think it's important sometimes to get sponsors on when people are critical of them. I think it's important to bring them on and answer these questions. So listen, if you do have any further questions about this, you can reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. But also, Zach and Flory will answer your questions. You can reach out to BlockFi as well if you've got anything you want to ask them. Anyway, thank you for listening. Also, as I said in the intro, I hope everyone's doing okay out there. These are strange times and they are rough times and it's likely going to get a lot tougher out there. The impact of the lockdowns on the economy can't be ignored. I know this will be affecting some of you, your businesses, perhaps your own health, being stuck at home all the time. Now, if you do want to reach out to me, you can. You can drop me an email. I will reply. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And yeah, just want to say love you all. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I look forward to seeing you soon.